Now for the closing hour, uh, we start uh, with uh, short final reflections on the present and future role for the world's commercial courts and for CIFOC for that matter. And to help us with that, we've invited six justices from across the world, each to contribute at no more than four minutes on their own reflections. And we begin from Kazakhstan, uh, Supreme Court Justice Madhyar Balkan. Madhyar. Okay. Dear forum participants, first of all, let me thank organizers, especially steering members and uh, founders of the CFOC for such an opportunity to participate uh, in the meeting. It's a great privilege and pleasure to be involved and attend discussions about problems, state and prospects reflecting professional professional leadership, desire to contribute development, rule of law and progressive principles. Uh, Supreme Court of Kazakhstan participating in CFOC meeting uh, for the first time, but uh, fortunately and uh, to our great joy, our modern court of AIC is among members of CFOC. For a year now, as you know, the most uh, pressing topic of discussion has been the pandemic, which caused dramatic consequences for all nations. We faced uh, with problems of access of, uh, to justice, needs to ensure security, restricting uh, re restrictions from government uh, technical infrastructure and algorithms of court administration and, of course, delivery of justice. Uh, we faced with difficult, uh, difficult cases, uh, with default cases, unemployment, etc. So in this situation, the role of courts in ensuring justice is tangible as attempt to reduce crisis. Moreover, the need to maintain wise balance between uh, use of legal remedies, principles of uh, reasonableness, justice and good faith, is particularly uh, particularly important. So, as of now, uh, in our region, uh, Supreme Courts published explanations uh, of legal positions, especially in field of commercial law and other areas of law. Uh, we expected uh, increase of cases in our jurisdiction, but fortunately, the simultaneous reforms of procedural law allowed us to have reduction of in the flow of cases. So what we have done for this, we transferred uh, undisputed issues to the notary, expanded uh, simplified procedure for uh, clear money claims. We transferred fines to enforcement agencies. So this way we uh, managed to focus uh, our resources, court resources to really controversial issues. Previously initiated uh, measures for the introduction of IT in courts also allowed us to quickly transfer courts to almost 100% uh, remote work. So diff different uh, services like year reconciliation, year case management, uh, mobile court office applications. So uh, anyway, uh, we feel necessary necessity to expand technological te technical cap cap capabilities, improve uh, quality of technical communication. Particularly important was explanatory work for courts, uh, explanatory works for court users via social media, social networks, and media. So it's clear that such changes will serve further for development of justice services and access to justice. In terms of uh, role of CFOC, uh, I believe that uh, all joint efforts within uh, CFOC are absolutely in demand for all jurisdictions. Over 
past few decades since last century, development of markets and political transformations uh, have significantly changed uh, political and economical map of the in the world. So new states have emerged from Eastern Europe to Far East. New markets have opened up. Kazakhstan, as a part of a former socialist uh, big region, uh, as our neighbor countries faced with uh, needs to establish new financial law and other branches have developed significantly uh, over first five last five years we developed investment justice in Kazakhstan uh, all Central Asia uh, countries uh, launched administrative justice but however in on my opinion uh, court procedures in our region still needs to be developed in order to successfully deal with variety of disputes and cases Unfortunately, in my opinion, our civil procedure uh, still based and keeps some roots from a uh, socialist model of law. Of course, this uh, past model uh, gives us some advantages like available litigation personam, uh, relatively, relatively uh, prompt procedures, affordable fees. But, however, we experiencing difficulties with abuse of rights in court. We uh, experience difficulties with high standards of adversary and uh, disclosure of proofs only on the early stage of the procedure. So uh, I absolutely agree with the uh, position of CFOC, especially uh, mentioned in working presumptions of international best practice in court in case management, that judicial leadership is necessary for successful case management. But judicial leadership alone is not sufficient. Joint efforts of parties and their representatives should approach case management as part of the problem-solving engagement. So we welcome CFOC and all respected members and appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with all of you. And in conclusion, just uh, may I share probably some several uh, topical issues for possible uh, discussion in future. They might be Major, like best practices in Major, I'm, ADR. Yeah. I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry to inter interrupt. But um, in, in terms of those issues for the future, we'll, we'll, we'll be picking up that subject a bit later in the meeting. Could, could I bring okay. your current Thank remarks you. to a conclusion with thanks there and move swiftly yeah, on yeah, if yeah, I sure. may? Move swiftly on, if I may, to South Korea and presiding judge SK Yoon. Sky, would you like to speak next? Yes. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, Chief Justices, Justices, Judges, and Professionals, I'm honored that I can call you my colleagues and especially pleased to get a chance to talk in front of you all. It is said that an ideal court should satisfy four standards. That is, the conclusion should be right and correct. The procedure should be fair. The decision should be rendered in time and the proceeding should not be overly expensive. In order to resolve the disputes effectively and restore the desired order back in place, the court should be able to persuade the public that it meets these standards in a stable manner. This is a predictability or reliability issue. Law merchant or Lex Mercatoria has been developing in, in the course of solving the needs of commerce, and there is a strong tendency of convergence. If the commercial courts of various jurisdictions could cooperate in exchanging best practices, taking advantage of mutual knowledge, experiences, and know-hows, and developing law and practice in tandem to guarantee better 
printability and reliability of individual code, such a harmonious legal environment will promote the commerce worldwide and people will be better off. This will lessen regional tension and will solve for the peace. For the course of a developing country, increase of the predictability and reliability of the courts and people's trust in those courts will promote not only the rule of law, but the economy, economic prosperity of the country. Uh, jurisdiction competition will decrease too. I'm sure CIFO is the right choice for all these great cause. Uh, as to the technology, we talked about the changes unavoidably incurred by new technologies and the benefit of utilizing the technology and the need of education or training. We, the judges in Korea, are also trying to keep up with the technology and the social change and to improve and adapt our court system to meet the change. The change is far reaching and requires deep review and adjustments, not only in hardware, but in software, rules and practices and mindsets. Um, the need for an education and training is not only for the judges, but for the practitioners, public prosecutors, and other related professionals, and most importantly, for the public. The work environments of the professionals and are interrelated and therefore the adjustments should be worked out together. We also have to pay close attention to the technology uses lack that exists among the people and make sure the renovated legal system should not discriminate people with lesser means in terms of technology. I believe the technical service centers for the public established by Singapore judiciary are a good example of such an effort. I thank you for your attention and special thanks to all my friends. Thank you from all your friends very much indeed, presiding Judge Yoon. We will next go to Hong Kong, Chief Justice Andrew Chung. Andrew. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Justice Knowles. I wish to start by thanking Chief Justice Menon and his Singaporean team, as well as the steering group led by Lord Thomas and the Secretariat of CFOC for organizing this highly successful meeting. I would like to share some brief reflections on specialized commercial courts. There are many factors which may affect the appeal or usefulness, as it were, of a commercial court to litigants as a forum for dispute resolution when compared with other commercial courts or with arbitration and mediation. I will mention three obvious factors. First, the availability of judges with the necessary expertise to man the commercial court. Where the jurisdiction is a relatively small one and the supply of legal and judicial talent is limited, experienced commercial judges may be difficult to find. Engaging part-time overseas judges with the necessary expertise to man the commercial court is certainly an attractive option. But the extent of willingness to, to, to do so varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Amongst other things, this would depend on the constitutional setup and the legal outlook of the jurisdiction concerned. A similar point can be made regarding the supply of experienced commercial lawyers with the requisite skill and expertise. Allowing foreign advocates to be admitted on an ad hoc basis to appear in the commercial court is no doubt an attraction to the parties. Yet the protection of the local legal profession has to be borne in mind, not so much for the sake of the interests of lawyers as such, but for public interests sake, as the maintenance of a strong and independent local legal profession 
is undeniably a matter of public interest. Secondly, a user-friendly approach to the practice and procedure of a commercial court matters. Take the proof of foreign law as an example. The traditional common law approach of treating questions of foreign law as questions of fact to be established by partisan expert evidence can be costly and time consuming. Instead, such issues may be treated as part of the legal submissions to be decided by the court. Again, to some extent, this would depend on the expertise and experience of the commercial judge involved and whether foreign advocates are allowed. Another example is the appeals procedure. To what extent a jurisdiction is prepared to adopt, for instance, a leapfrog appeal procedure to shorten its normal appeals process may affect the party's willingness to litigate in, the, in this commercial court. Jurisdictions with different legal traditions and judicial outlook may come to different conclusions. Thirdly, the question of enforcement of judgments may be crucial, absent the equivalent of a New York Convention for commercial judgments. A jurisdiction which has concluded many bilateral or multilateral agreements or mutual agree recognition and enforcement of commercial judgments with other jurisdictions is likely to have an edge in attracting international commercial litigation. Naturally, different parties may find a different commercial course to be more appealing, whether generally or specifically in relation to a particular dispute or type of dispute. For instance, the recent arrangement reached by Hong Kong and mainland China for reciprocal recognition and enforcement of civil and commercial judgments is likely to make Hong Kong an attractive forum for commercial litigation where one or more of the parties involved are Chinese mainland entities once the necessary local legislation is enacted. So much for my thoughts on this topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief Justice, very much indeed. We now move to France and Judge Fabienne Schaller from the Paris International Appellate Court. Fabienne. Thank you, <clears throat> Robin. Good morning to you all. It's a great honor to be given the floor towards the close of this session. Our exchanges have been particularly fruitful and constructive so far, opening new challenges for commercial courts in order to meet the needs for court users. Uh, I would like to present recent developments in France following the establishment in 2018 of the International Commercial Chamber of the Court of Appeal of Paris, the ICCPCA for short, uh, where I sit as a judge and which specializes in international commercial disputes and international arbitration. First, let me stress that French courts are in favor of arbitration and French arbitration law has been completely incorporated in the Code of Civil Procedure since 1981 and was reinforced in 2011, giving more predictability and certainty to our decisions. French judges dealing with arbitral awards on appeal cannot re-examine the merits of the award. The grounds for annulment of an arbitral award are strictly limited to five checks. Is there improper constitution of the arbitral award or improper jurisdiction of the award or violation of due process, failure to respect the mandate of the arbitral tribunal or violation of international public policy. Recent decisions of our court of the ICCPCA are available on the website of the court that we have created and many of the decisions are available in French and in English and soon in Spanish and Chinese. Um, it's important for users and for judges and lawyers, of course, but users are lawyers as well, to access and compare judgments from various commercial courts relating to international commercial disputes and arbitration. 
and it's a valuable source of inspiration and above all a valuable source for the elaboration of a common legal corpus. The exchange of best practices starts with extended knowledge and mutual respect within the framework of the rule of law. Our common purpose is getting the best from arbitration and courts. Mediation is also becoming more and more common in commercial matters. Still, the rule of law remains the foundation and the French Justice Reform Act, which was promulgated on March 23, 2019, pretty recently, extends the scope of alternative dispute resolution and allows the judge to order the parties to meet with a mediator at any stage of the proceedings. And this is becoming more and more successful in commercial matters. France also allows the development of online mediation services. And this is very important. A decree regulates the certification of these online services to make sure of their seriousness. Depending on how much AI, artificial intelligence, intervenes in the decision-making process in order to make sure that still human input remains essential. Enforcement of mediation decisions is also an important issue, as we have seen. The 2020 Singapore Convention appears to bring a valuable addition to the set of tools available for the alternative dispute resolution of cross-border commercial matters, and this is for the good of users. And finally, a few words on the COVID-19 pandemic impact on commercial dispute resolution, as we have already seen. Besides the negative effects of the pandemic, such as postponement of court hearings, unfortunately, we have seen that COVID-19 has brought new ways of working, new challenges. The commercial court system in most countries has developed practical solutions, such as online trials, remote case management, digital filing. In France, the development of online proceedings and the improvement in, in the improvement of remote communication techniques have been successfully implemented in the domain of commercial justice. The Paris Commercial Court during the lockdown last year managed to handle nearly 90% of its cases remotely and successfully. So one of the important questions to continue to be discussed is whether these new tools will be transformed into legal doctrines and shape the development of law for commercial dispute resolution in the long term in the respect of the rule of law. I am sure that there will be many more reflections on these very challenging issues already discussed. And CIFOC is a fantastic forum for that. And I very much thank all the organizers. I extend my thanks to our Singapore hosts, to Robin, to the Secretariat, and to all my colleagues. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for those reflections, uh, Judge Scheller. Now, in, 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 we'll now board our virtual aeroplane and go from Paris across the world to Malaysia, where Judge Nalini Pathmanathan will speak next. Nalini. Thank you very much, Justice Knowles. Can you hear me? We can. Good. I would like to make two points on the present and future role of CFOC. Following on from Sir jo uh, Jeffrey Voss's enlightening points yesterday, a plausible future role for CFOC would be the collective development and evolution of new approaches to dispute resolution in our commercial courts in light of our increasing dependence on technology. The twin aspects of technology that require addressing, as I understood it yesterday, comprise on the one hand, the substantive law aspect in relation to new inventions and products as, ex as exemplified by crypto assets, and smart contracts. The second aspect is the procedural ac aspect of technology as grafted onto the existing judicial process, be it adversarial or civil. The way we have approached technology thus far in most jurisdictions has largely been to adapt the technology to meet the traditional manner in which we conduct litigation in our commercial courts. This has certainly improved efficiency. What we have not done is to adapt the procedural aspects of the judicial process 
as they currently exist to meet the needs of current and emerging technology or commerce or new commercial inventions as they continue to evolve. Necessity is the mother of invention and we have adapted our court processes to meet the needs of access to justice, particularly during the pandemic. But it is important that we progress and evolve from this upheaval. The pandemic has, if anything, brought about change which paradoxically will ultimately be for the betterment of the legal and commercial world. So to fully exploit technology in the context of dispute resolution, we should perhaps be prepared to put our existing systems of adjudication under scrutiny with a view to evolving our existing systems to meet the current needs of commerce and commercial litigants. Can we, for example, undertake some of the processes in new ways and incorporate technology to facilitate the use and enforcement of, for example, smart contracts more readily? Can we do away with parts of the established modes of trial without jeopardizing due process or the administration of justice? Can cross-examination, for example, be undertaken in a different manner in a document-based case where it's undertaken by one judge while the final decision maker is another judge who determines the matter by way of transcript, all of which is on blockchain? CFOC could most certainly play a role in transforming existing court systems in relation to the enforcement of rights arising from new commercial products such as smart contracts by obtaining consensus from its member states on the best practices or technology to be utilized for online dispute resolutions. We've already, already seen examples of this in Singapore and China. Now, the second point I wish to make is this. CFOC, the brainchild of Lord Thomas, serves to engender both efficiency and trust amongst the individual judicial arms of sovereign states. It does so, as we have seen, by collating and disseminating commercial practices and laws globally, promoting the comprehension of commercial legislation and practices in individual states, and particularly why national courts in various countries function as they do, uh, by contributing substantially towards the harmonization of commercial best practices and laws globally in accordance with the rule of law, by increasing the use of technology in national commercial courts, and for the future, encouraging a diversity of thought and philosophy in commercial jurisprudence and developing newer theories to meet the changing face of the law and commerce. These measures will ensure procuring an effective remedy, an essential component of access to justice at a global level. In this context, a core aspect of the rule of law is that the various nations in this grouping are at different levels, both economically and in terms of the maturity of their commercial court systems. There is always a danger that the perspective of less mature economies and commercial court systems might go unrecognized as international trade is often dominated by the views of the more developed states. This grouping should set a standard of best practices which accommodate the diversity and varied philosophies of the member states. Ultimately, we are fostering trust in our, in our individual judicial systems within the grouping. And that must be the strongest way to ensure greater cooperation and harmonization with each other. Thank you. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Chief Justice Sundresh Menon and my friends, from, friends, my fellow judges from Singapore and his team from Singapore, as well as the Secretariat from London, Sir Robin Knowles and Ms. Grace Karras for the flawless conduct of this virtual con conference. Thank you very much. Justice Pethbenathan, thank you very much for those, those reflections. We have one final set of reflections before the closing address. Uh, and the final set of reflections comes from India. Uh, Mr. Justice Pratik Jalan. Pratik. Thank you, Robin, uh, uh, for giving me the floor. As a new entrant to CFOC, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share some thoughts on uh, the deliberations of the last uh, couple of days. I would like to spend just the first minute or so to talk about India's response, and particularly the response of my court, which is the Delhi High Court, to the uh, COVID uh, pandemic. And I hope that will lead into a couple of issues that I hope our engagement with CFOC will help us with uh, later. 
The uh, response on COVID, I'm relieved to see uh, from the remarks that all of you have made over the last couple of days, has been uh, relatively uh, robust as far as Indian courts are concerned as well. The, we have responded both judicially, uh, legislatively, and through regulatory mechanisms to the uh, needs of the, uh, that have flown from the pandemic. They have involved, for example, a judicial order extending periods of limitation, uh, legislation uh, putting a close to certain insolvency proceedings for the moment, suspending them, and uh, central bank regulations granting a moratorium on payment of interest for certain classes of debtors. The uh, judicial response in terms of the use of technology has also, as Chief Justice Menon pointed out yesterday, been uh, accelerated. His remarks uh, ring very true to our experience as well, where I think perhaps a couple of decades worth of progress was made in this last uh, one year. That said, uh, the delegate uh, from Kenya yesterday had raised the issue of the digital divide. And while I completely take the point that uh, Sir Jeffrey Boz and Chief Justice Menon made to that, the uh, experience of a country of economic and geographical diversity, such as India's, is one which perhaps gives rise to problems uh, that are more, uh, more acute in this regard. Uh, being in the Delhi High Court, we serve a relatively small geographical area and an urban area where we don't have those problems. But I know that my colleagues in other parts of the country have suffered from, uh, for example, a lack of bandwidth or a different culture of doing business. It's not just a question of internet connectivity or uh, penetration of, of the mobile uh, phone, but a culture where you go to the courthouse and meet your lawyer, et cetera, et cetera. The, uh, we have to uh, think about how to uh, work these things into a transition to a more technological uh, regime. The uh, Chief Justice Menon had yesterday mentioned that this is virtually a a transitional phase, and I, I uh, totally uh, agree with that. But even through this transitional phase, I think our experience shows that it is meeting with some disquiet and some resistance, particularly from the bar. And there I would be very interested if CFOC could assist us in sharing experiences of other countries in how to deal with, uh, with a situation like this so that technology truly is used even for uh, countries like mine as an enabler rather than seen as a, as a force of resistance. Uh, with uh, those thoughts, just a couple of other issues on which I think perhaps uh, CFOC could be of, uh, of great uh, help to a new entrant like uh, my court. One is uh, in the development of what I would call a commercial court culture and jurisprudence, where uh, perhaps uh, Sir Jeffrey Voss, for example, yesterday had mentioned that the nature of disputes is shifting in the commercial world. I think that is a phenomenon that is perhaps very nascent in an economy like uh, mine. And I would be very interested to hear what are those kind of changes so that we can also perhaps be somewhat uh, more prepared and, and ready for those. The second is in the training of lawyers to deal with a different kind of litigation that comes, uh, much was said yesterday about the training of, of judges, and that's uh, totally, uh, totally on point as far as India is concerned as well. But I wonder if we can also expand that, uh, as Judge Yoon of South Korea also mentioned today, to cover training of lawyers as well. And the third point, which I would just like to flag, is if we could work on the development of some more comprehensive indices and met matrices to assess the efficacy of uh, commercial court systems. Some of the more, uh, more popular indices like the ease of doing business, at least as far as India is concerned, concentrate only on big commercial centers like Delhi and Mumbai. Whereas of course commerce is uh, taking place everywhere in a country like ours. And perhaps uh, CIFOC could, uh, could take on uh, some, uh, could guide us in how to develop ways of assessing the efficacy of our commercial court system. I just wanted to flag these uh, few reflections and issues and to conclude by offering uh, my great uh, gratitude to Chief Justice Menon and the Supreme Court of Singapore for hosting this session, to Lord Thomas and the CFOX Steering Committee, as well as the Secretariat guided by uh, Sir Robin Knowles and Grace Farras for organizing such a wonderful uh, conference. I have uh, learned much from it and look forward to a more active and uh, continued engagement with CFOC and with my colleagues from across the world. Thank you very much. 
Justice Jalan, thank you to you. Um, it is such a pleasure that uh, India uh, now joins uh, CIFOC, and thank you for those reflections. We, we turn now to the closing address, which will be given by Lord Chief Justice Ian Burnett. Lord Chief Justice. Good morning from London and greetings, whatever may be your time of day. Many of us were looking forward to meeting in Singapore last March. I suspect that when inevitably that meeting of CIFOC was postponed, none of us realized that we would be denied the pleasure of each other's physical company a year later. For all of us, the last 12 months have been extraordinarily difficult. But this conference is a living illustration of how quickly the legal and judicial world, indeed the whole world, has adapted rapidly to the assault that COVID-19 has made on ordinary ways of living and working. When the current emergency is over, none of us will be returning to the ways of living and working we enjoyed in past years. Thursday's fascinating discussion on technology in the new world demonstrated that both business and the law are on a rapid journey as technology develops as an aid to all we do and changes so much. This third full meeting of CIFOP comes at a time when the need for commercial dispute resolution is likely to grow. We know that times of economic and business distress are often followed by litigation. The impact of COVID has not been uniform in all countries, but there has been both a short-term and lasting damage to many businesses, although some have powered ahead. Robin Knowles reminded us yesterday of the three core aims of CIFOC. First, to serve business and markets by sharing best practice between courts and enabling us to keep pace with rapid commercial change. Secondly, to assist courts to work together in order to make a strong contribution to the rule of law internationally. And thirdly, to support jurisdictions in less well-developed economies to enhance their attractiveness to investors by offering effective means for resolving commercial disputes. CIFOC was the brainchild of my predecessor, Lord Thomas, and held its first meeting in London in 2017 with the participation of fewer than 30 jurisdictions. Now, there are almost 40 with representation today from Africa, Asia, Australasia, the Caribbean, Europe, the Middle East, and both North and South America. They are made up of both common law and civilian jurisdictions. This conference has confirmed that there is much that we can learn from each other. For example, I was particularly struck by the short discussion on case management and the observation of Chief Justice Menon that the length of written submissions has got out of hand. CIFOC's work on this topic is invaluable. Procedural rules and judicial case management exist to encourage the swift, cost-effective and fair resolution of disputes in the interests of justice. The interests of justice are rarely the same as the interests of lawyers, or even, dare I say it necessarily, the interests of judges. A continuing examination of how commercial litigation is conducted will repay dividends for those who use our courts to resolve disputes. The sessions on meeting the needs of those court users and on third party litigation funding provided further examples of the sharing of information and practice in areas which are not free from difficulty. Of course, the work of CIFOC continues between its full meetings. A great deal of work shared amongst the members has been done not only on case management, but on mutual enforcement of judgments, technology, and sharing the experience of long established commercial courts with those in jurisdictions developing their own capability. CIFOC continues to work with international organizations to share experience and to support the rule of law. The vast majority of commercial transactions are completed without acrimony or dispute. 
inevitably others are not. It is a truism that when it comes to international investment, all businesses have an eye to how disputes would be resolved locally. A capable and independent judicial system is something that businesses take into account when making investment and commercial decisions. They need to be confident that there exists the right expertise and legal infrastructure in the courts and that those courts will confidently find against powerful local interests if the justice of the case demands that outcome. There is an inescapable link between the proper functioning of courts dealing with commercial disputes, business confidence, investment, particularly international investment, and the sustenance of the rule of law. Chief Justice also earlier this morning explained, if I may say so uh, authoritatively, the link between the international rule of law and commercial and civil courts. Involvement in CIFOC is likely to improve the workings of commercial dispute resolution in all the participating jurisdictions and in many make a tangible contribution to development, growing economic activity and prosperity. Above all that, CIFOC provides an opportunity for judges from jurisdictions of so many different sorts to gather together at meetings, work together on projects in between, and come to know and understand each other and each other's jurisdictions better. That has its own great value. In this closing session of its third meeting, we've just heard six judicial reflections on the present and future role uh, of the world's commercial courts and of CIFOP itself. Uh, these have been thought provoking and will help send us away with ideas for the future and set the scene for the next meeting. May I finish by echoing the thanks which have been expressed throughout this meeting by so many speakers to Chief Justice Menon and his team in Singapore. You have been marvelous hosts and also to Lord Thomas and the Steering Committee and Secretariat in London. I continue to marvel at how simultaneously we can hear contributions from six continents with only a small number of broadband wobbles or computer glitches. The silver lining of the current circumstances is that more easily than ever, we can keep in touch with colleagues all over the world. Nonetheless, I hope that the fourth full meeting of CIFOP will enable many of us to meet once more in person. Thank you. It's now um, my opportunity just to say what we should be thinking of and to talk about our next meeting. I think in doing so, it's important to reflect on the achievements so far. But although we have had a wonderful report on case management, uh, noted for its brevity, for the very pioneering work on enforcement with Sir William Blair and Judge Ansel, uh, and the production of us all through the COVID-19 memorandum, there is work to be done. And going back to Chief Justice Alsop and Sir Peter Grass, I think many judges will feel the heartfelt plea that has just been made by uh, Lord Chief Justice uh, on the need for short submissions. And so there is work on all three to be done. I think that this conference itself has pointed the way also to our future. I think the website produced uh, for this meeting has been excellent. And I very much hope that we'll be able to import a lot onto the CIFOC own website, but it shows the importance of an excellent website. Secondly, I think the idea of opening up much of this uh, has shown what is the strength and hallmark of the courts, that is its openness and transparency. And much of what we've discussed will now become into the public domain. The one area I would encourage you to uh, say a little bit on is the forum discussion which was a pioneering venture, and it would be very useful if people could have a look at it and see if they wish to express any views. But the, few, the main task of mine this morning is just to say what is further work to be done. 
Uh, I would be very grateful if people would liaise uh, with the Secretariat uh, and take forward things that they want, because this is a members organization where your views and what we do uh, are, are so important. Various ideas have been raised this morning, uh, but I won't go over them again. Those have been noted and recorded. The steering committee decided that it would be a good idea to have three main topics uh, for this session. First, uh, the uh, program in relation to digital uh, work. Secondly, litigation funding. And thirdly, the position of court users. A and we did so in part to see whether this is an area where we should go forward and do some more work. Was well, something needed to be done? It seems to me, and these are my own personal views, which I haven't, because of our remoteness, not been able to, and the time changes, not been able to discuss with the full steering committee. And so these are purely personal views, and maybe my colleagues will say that I've got it all wrong. But first of all, it seems to me that there is a huge work to be done, and as Justice and Palai Schultz spoke this morning about, and that is the two areas of digital work. What do we do to rethink court procedure? You're always told when you put in a new system of IT that you must think again. And I wonder whether we've thought sufficiently. But parallel with that, how do you equip courts, judges and lawyers for the paperless hearing? And so we can all aspire to a room without any paper. Uh, <clears throat> that, I think, is one topic we really ought to, to visit, but also in the context of uh, which uh, Chief Justice Menon spoke so eloquently, and that is training for the future. And then there is the different topic uh, of <clears throat> the impact on the works of the court through digital commerce, uh, digital transactions, digital currencies and crypto assets. And as Sir Jeffrey Voss brought up yesterday, that really is a fundamental change as it takes place. And we ought to, although this change may not happen for a few years, I think we ought to begin to think it through now. And then there was the topic of litigation funding. I listened to it yesterday afternoon and I listened to it this morning. And I think it's fair to say that in some countries, the view is all is well, don't worry. Another, there are real concerns, and in some, we haven't got any experience yet, but we are anxious to see what will happen. And I think that the broad range of discussion shows the issues that need to be addressed, the benefits of access to justice, dealing with uh, group actions, the use in litigation arbitration, the public interest that everyone has in the form of litigation and some degree of control over it the protection of litigants, and the comparison with contingency fees. And as, uh, Lord, uh, <clears throat> as Chief Justice Lord David Hope pointed out, trying to work out the respective responsibilities uh, of the courts, of government, and of course of self-regulation. And so I think that may be another topic which we ought to look at. And finally, there's the topic of, of court users. I think there are two areas here we need to, possibly to look at. Uh, one is are the links with arbitration sufficient? Uh, the arbitrators have a wonderful means of communicating their views about courts. The ECHO yearbooks are, for example, excellent. And there is quite a lot of work on the national side in making certain that there is harmony between the courts and uh, arbitral institutions. But does CIFOC have a role, and it's a question I ask, in trying to deal transnationally with issues of international arbitration? And I think, again, what has come out of this morning's discussion is the second topic. How do we best communicate with users? Have we learned something uh, from the use of hybrid meetings? Uh, <coughs> It, is, it was often, I was told, said, well, you, you ask if someone's got to go to a meeting, that's time out of the office, times of traveling. Will we get, for example, much better attendance from people properly engaged in work if we're able to do these on a hybrid way? And should we involve more uh, uh, from the outside in our court new, uh, users' meetings, particularly, for example, litigation funding? So I think these are just my own personal reflections, but I very much would like the steering committee uh, in the fairly near future uh, to start to pick topics we think ought to be developed arising out of your own views and out of the topics we've discussed at this meeting.
In the meantime, uh, I hope we will encourage uh, CEFOC and regional groupings of CEFOC to continue to work with organizations. I think our liaison with the Commonwealth Magistrates and Judges Association was particularly successful. But can I uh, finalize by saying something uh, about the topic to which uh, Lord, <coughs> Lord Burnett referred, and that is namely our next meeting. We have so far uh, traveled uh, from London to New York and uh, in essence to Singapore, uh, of which more are known. But I am extraordinarily indebted to Chief Justice James Allsop and Chief Justice Tom Batters uh, for very kindly suggesting that we might care to visit uh, Australia uh, in uh, 2022. It takes us through to another continent. And I think in timing that uh, they've suggested uh, that maybe Sydney uh, for the 20th and 21st of October uh, 2022. Uh, we've made preliminary checks that this is a date that doesn't seem to coincide with any particular uh, <coughs> insuperable difficulty. And we will obviously look to see whether there are aspects of a hybrid meeting that we can deploy. But I cannot agree more with, uh, with, with Lord Burnett, and I'm sure with everyone's sentiment, that it would be very good to be able to meet together again. Now, it's my next pleasure uh, to uh, ask uh, Chief Justice Menon to uh, 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 say uh, uh, a few words. But before doing so, and I think as a particular tribute, I would be grateful if everyone would turn their camera on. So we can hear, we can see you in rapt attention uh, to the Chief Justice and take a, a virtual group photograph. I'm sure this will be successful. So can I just pause, please turn your cameras on. You're going to be photographed, but we couldn't have a better uh, way, not cheese, but rapt attention uh, to the Chief Justice. So if I can hand over now to Chief Justice uh, Menon, pausing for a sec, pausing at some stage during your speech, so we can have this wonderful group photograph. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so <coughs> much, uh, John. Um, uh, Lord Thomas, uh, my friends, Chief Justices, Justices, Judges, my friends, uh, it really is a pleasure to speak to you and to close this conference. Um, CIFOC has rapidly established its value as a forum at which commercial judges can gather to share knowledge and exchange experiences and learn together. And I think that this is especially important in the context of commercial courts for at least three reasons. First, in this space, with the rapid and dramatic growth of cross-border trade, there is an ever-growing and continuing need for a predictable and efficient framework that will deliver justice in a broadly consistent way. Second, commerce has its own needs, including a particular commitment to efficiency and a thoughtful awareness on the part of judges to the subject matter of these disputes. And third, to pick up a point that we discussed yesterday, this is an area that is undergoing dramatic and rapid transformation with the infusion of technology into every aspect of our lives, including inevitably the administration of justice. I think all of these three points have been thrown into sharp focus over the course of the last year, as the world was completely upended by the COVID-19 pandemic. In that light, I want to say that on behalf of all of my colleagues in the Singapore judiciary, um, we truly feel immensely privileged to have had this opportunity to host this meeting. Uh, if there is one regret, and there is one regret, it is that we could not have, we could not host you in person. Um, we in Singapore are extremely proud of many things in our country, including our hospitality, our food, the beauty of our city, and it really leaves us sad that we couldn't share that with all of you. But nonetheless, it has been an immense privilege for us to be able to host this forum virtually. I want to reiterate my profound thanks to Lord Thomas. 
Um, he really has been an outstanding figure in leading Suffolk. I recall my first discussion with him about the idea of this, I think in 2016. And I don't think either of us ever envisaged that five years later would be looking at an institution as vast and as important as Suffolk has grown up to be. And I think all of that has really been down to his inspirational leadership, the way that he has um, kept this going and the way that he has remained so closely engaged. And I really, really am profoundly grateful to John and want to express on behalf of all of us our gratitude to him. But I also want to thank the steering group, which um, I'm a part of, and we've been working together, meeting throughout this course to discuss a number of ideas. And John uh, and Robin have been very, very uh, uh, instrumental in the success of the work of the steering group. I also want to thank each and every one of the speakers and contributors. Uh, it has been a joy that despite the fact that we have had um, participants from six continents in multiple time zones. We've actually been able to conduct discussions well, receive and hear what each other is saying and, and embrace those ideas. And that really is a tribute to the commitment of everybody here, the speakers, the contributors and the participants. And I wanna thank all of you. I want to thank Robin and Grace and the Secretariat for being simply outstanding and excellent colleagues to work with. There was quite a lot of work involved in the um, run up to this conference in terms of organizing it and getting everything together. We couldn't have asked for a better group of people to work with. And I really want to thank Robert and Grace for that. And lastly, please allow me the indulgence of uh, thanking by name uh, several of my colleagues, uh, Pang Xiao Chung, the Divisional Registrar of the SICC, Yuna Kung, Colin Xiao, Navin Anand, Kurshet Haron, Nurul Sultana Ali Ahmad, and Teresa Yeo. Um, there was a host of other people, but I particularly wanted to name these uh, colleagues for having been such outstanding members of the team for delivering us to the point that we're at today. So I really want to thank all of them. I very much look forward to seeing all of you um, uh, in October, 2022. Uh, let me be amongst the first to thank Tom Bathurst and James Alsop for um, uh, agreeing to host this next event. And I very much hope that we will be able to see most, if not all of you, in person in Sydney. Um, but before then, I just wanted to, to echo one point that was made, which is that uh, we can very much stay in touch, not only through the regional groupings that uh, John spoke about, but also informally, because one of the things that a forum like this affords us is the chance to build bridges and relationships at a personal level. And through this, we are now in touch with each other. And if we had issues that we wanted to discuss or talk to one another about either regionally or across um, regions, we can do that. And I hope that we will feel free to do that through the friendships that we foster in this grouping. Until then, Thank you all very much, and uh, I wish you good health. I wish your families good health, and I very much look forward to uh, being in touch and seeing you soon. Thank you. And may I, in a very, very few words, say a, a few final thanks. I think my first thanks is to thank you all for the privilege of being able to chair uh, this uh, organization and to the steering committee who have really driven it forward. Everyone has made an enormous contribution and we've been privileged to have it representing all the, reg all the areas of the world and the continents. And secondly, turning to this particular meeting, uh, I would like particularly to thank those from outside the judiciary who have contributed and, and those who've joined in the discussions. Particularly, can I thank Susan Dunn, who, uh, I, who came yesterday afternoon. I don't think she realized quite how many questions she'd be asked. A and Mr. Audley Shepherd and the others who, who have been present to talk about arbitration and have remained to us. So thank you very much indeed. 
The contribution from the members has been outstanding, and it's been a particular pleasure to note that I don't know how one, what greeting you have to someone who gets up in the middle of the night, uh, but it's been very nice to see Judge from Jamaica and, and also judges from New York uh, coming up in the middle of the night to, uh, uh, in the middle of their night. And then I think I really must pay because, because I think I must my, my own personal thanks to the work that's been done uh, by uh, Sir Robin Knowles and Grace Karras. The hours which he has spent on this, as I know, have been tremendous, and so has Grace. Without their devotion and without the incredibly efficient way in which they ha handled the Secretariat and uh, have organised this, uh, we would not have nearly uh, had such a successful meeting. But can I turn finally to what I might call Team Singapore? Uh, we're all immensely sad that we couldn't visit Singapore, but we made the right decision to have this online. It's a wonderful country. You can't go to a more hospitable, beautiful place. Uh, but and we've had to, we've made up for that. I think that the technology uh, that has, has been used has been flawless. It's the best I've ever seen. And we've had to deal with all the times, almost all the time zones of the world. The organization has been superb. Uh, I don't think there is any other word than that single one. It's been enormously gratifying to have the support of the Singapore government, not only in helping to put this on, but also uh, in their contributions they've made, including the contributions in person this morning. But above all, can my thanks go to Chief uh, Justice Sundaresh Menon, uh, his energy, his determination, and his vision are legendary. And I think it's been our good fortune uh, to see all of those deployed uh, to such enormous uh, successful effect uh, to make this meeting, uh, virtual meeting, possible. Thank you very, very much, Sundaresh, for the outstanding uh, meeting you have hosted for us all. And we only can regret the enormous hospitality that we've, the circumstances have forced us uh, not to be able to enjoy. But can I again uh, thank uh, uh, our prospective hosts uh, for uh, next year. Um, I, I, it is enormously kind uh, of Tom Berthurst and, and James Alsop to invite us to come. I very much hope uh, that, uh, that nothing will transpire that stops this. Uh, and we look forward very much. But in the meantime, uh, please keep in close touch in the ways that so many have suggested and let us work on some topics for next year to do what was our founding aim, which is to strengthen the importance of and the work of commercial courts in facilitating international uh, <coughs> com uh, commerce and trade and to support the rule of law, but also equally importantly, to help those uh, who are developing commercial court systems to get the best possible. Thank you all so very, very much indeed. And good morning, good evening, <coughs> uh, good night. And to those in the middle of the night, I, would, would I, I hope you will now go back and have a very good rest of the night's sleep. But thank you again very, very much indeed to everyone.